<coughs> in the name of the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit, Amen. Thank you, Abba Father. <coughs> Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit, Lord. Lord God, you brought us once again to listen to you, the truth. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for this wonderful day. Thank you for gathering all of us once again. Thank you for Brother Vincent giving us this beautiful teaching every day. Every day will the truth that is setting us free and, and helping us also to abide in the word. And Lord God, I thank you, Lord Jesus. Let this word be uh, in our hearts, in the good soil of our hearts, so that we do not forget and that the same word we can give it to others. That's the only way we can even share the love with others, Lord God. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for this wonderful day. Lord, I, I also want to say the scripture, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and suffer the loss of his own? For you, Lord God, giving them the truth and setting them free, Lord God. Lord, we make this prayer in the holy, mighty name of Jesus. Amen, amen, amen. 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 Thank you, Sister Marcella. Thank you for that very spirit-filled opening prayer. And my brothers and sisters, a warm welcome to each one of you. Today, we are going to reflect, as I mentioned to you at the introduction, on the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 9, verses 22 to 25. But I want to begin with verse number 21 onwards, because... As we go to 21, we'll be able to get a continuity into verse number 22 onwards. So let's go to Luke chapter 9, verses 21 to 25. And first we'll read it, and then we'll reflect on those verses one by one. Praise God. Luke chapter 9, verses 21 to 25. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Are you getting it? Okay, you can start reading them and then we'll go ahead. Start reading, yeah. And he straightly charged them and commanded them to tell no man that thing, saying, the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be slain, and be raised the third day. And he said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. For what is a man advantage if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away? Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. So my sisters and brothers, we come to verse number 21 and we see there Jesus is saying, and he straightly charged them and commanded them to tell no man that thing. So what is the, that thing that he had, uh, what, that he commanded them not to tell? You know, Jesus, you know, had just asked his disciples, if you read from verses, just before verse number 21, if you read, you know, Jesus had asked his disciples who he really was. You know, he wanted to know what the disciples really thought about him. And you know, my brothers and sisters, he had first introduced the subject to his disciple by saying, who do people say I am? And then he had actually followed it up with a question by asking his disciples, who do you guys who are with me all this time, who do you really think I am? And you know, Peter on, on, on behalf of all the disciples had told Jesus that he was the Christ. He was the son of the living God. And you know, my brothers and sisters, what Peter had answered was actually the truth. Jesus was the son of God. He is the son of God. He was the chosen Messiah. He was the one who was to come into the world. And now Peter, who had actually been along with the other disciples interacting with Jesus, he had told Jesus the truth 
But this was something that was revealed to Peter, not through a knowledge that was given to him by anybody. Jesus had never told his disciples that he was the Messiah. Jesus had never told them that he's the son of God. Jesus had only been preaching the gospel. So this revelation that Peter had got, that Jesus is the Messiah, the son of God, had come from the heavenly father, had come through the Holy Spirit. And yet, my brothers and sisters, Jesus tells his disciples, do not tell anyone about this. You know, if, 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 if Peter is telling Jesus the truth, he's telling Jesus, you know, Jesus, you are the Messiah, you are the son of the living God. And it is the truth because Jesus said, good for you, Peter. It's not flesh and blood who revealed this to you, but my father in heaven. So, brothers and sisters, it's very clear that what Peter had told Jesus that day was the truth. Jesus is the Messiah. But again, Jesus doesn't want the disciples. He doesn't want Peter. He doesn't want any of his close people to ever let anyone know. Now, you know, if they had told other people about it, you know what? This man is no ordinary man. He is the Messiah. He is the one, the chosen son of God. Even if he had, they had to tell others, the people would not have believed. They would not have believed. You know, it would have actually caused more problems for Jesus, more trouble for Jesus, and it would have stopped Jesus from carrying out God's purpose and fulfilling it before he went to the cross. You know, think about it, my brothers and sisters. Jesus was given an assignment by the Father. He was told that he must preach certain things. He must teach his disciples. He must prepare them. He was told to go ahead to the different places of Israel. He was told to go and share the good news. He was told to preach the gospel. And yet, my brothers and sisters, if Jesus had not stopped his disciples from opening their mouth and telling the other people, this particular information that he is the Messiah would have actually brought in more opposition. As it is, my brothers and sisters, you know, the, the religious leaders were against Jesus. You know, even today, if you really go and see the, the, in the church today, anyone in the church who does not follow the doctrine, who doesn't follow, who doesn't come in line, who doesn't come according to what the teachings of the of what the church teaches, they are not in line, but they, they preach according to the truth of God's word, they are surely going to be people whom people are going to look with a, with, with, a, with a microscope. They are going to look at them, you know, very suspiciously. They are going to start labeling them all sorts of things. They are going to think about them as Protestants. They are going to think of them as people who are rebels. Actually speaking, people who preach according to the truth of God's word are the ones who are going to face maximum persecution. They are the ones who are going to face maximum opposition. They are the ones who are going to find people inside the church coming against them. And so, brothers and sisters, here is Jesus, the son of God, who is preaching the truth from his father. And because of those religious leaders at that time, because of those Pharisees, because of the scribes, because of those lawyers who are not happy because he's not, you know, teaching their, 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 their theology. He's not teaching the, the people what they are actually been promoting among themselves. He's not going in line with what they are saying. They are now ready to crucify Jesus. And eventually, they do crucify Jesus and they take him to the cross. You know, sisters and brothers, you know, if you read what he says in verse number 22, will now be like exactly what I told you. That's the reason he said, don't you ever tell anybody about it. Let's go to verse number 22 and see exactly what I just said to you actually is what he told his disciples would happen to him. And, they, and that's what really happened to him. Saying, the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be slain and be raised the third day. Now, now look at this. A few moments earlier, Peter has told Jesus that he is the Messiah he is the son of God. He is the chosen one sent by the father. And yet, my brothers and sisters, what Peter had just told him, you know, would not fit with what Peter had just said a short while ago. Jesus is telling him, I must be crucified. I must go. I will be slain. I will be, you know, I will be rejected by the elders. I'll be rejected by the chief priests. I'll be rejected by the scribes. I will be put to death, but I will raise, be raised up on the third day. You know, my brothers and sisters, if he was the Christ, 
if he was the son of God, then how come he would have to die? How come he would have to die? You know, my brothers, Peter had just told Jesus, you are the Messiah. You are the son of the living God. You are the chosen one sent by the father. Then how come Jesus, you are going to die? And you know, my brothers and sisters, this is exactly the theme of our today's reflection. Our theme of today's reflection is the rejection of every true believer. If you really believe in Jesus, be ready for being rejected. Be re ready for being persecuted. Be ready for being you know, spat at. Be ready for being misunderstood. Be ready for being isolated. But if you are afraid, if you are afraid of persecution, you are afraid of being rejected, you are afraid of you know, uh, disturbing the status quo, and you're not going to speak the truth, you're going to hide the truth, you're just going to follow the same beaten track, then my brothers and sisters, you will never be going against the current. You will not be going against the flow, but you will simply be going with the flow of this world. You'll simply be flowing in the water which goes from upstream, downstream. You will never ever face persecution. You know, my brothers and sisters, listen to this very carefully. You know, if we are truly God's children now, then why should we face persecution and rejection and even be constantly facing death? That's the question I want to ask you. If you really believe you are a child of God, if you really believe you are a son, you are a daughter of the Most High, then why should you and I be afraid to face persecution, face rejection, and even, you know, have a threat to our own life? You know, my brother says, how come even today, there are those who call themselves Christian, but are unwilling to step out due to, you know, fear of rejection, persecution, and all those things that go with it. Why is that? Why are those people calling themselves Christian? They're calling themselves Christian because probably they go to a particular church. They call themselves Christian because they have a baptism certificate. They call themselves Christian because they go and follow the liturgy of that particular church. They call themselves Christian because they got a Christian name. But you know, my sister and brothers, it is, you know, the reason why people today, even who are calling themselves Christians are, you know, afraid of rejection. It is because they either do not know the truth. This is a very important thing that you need to remember. They either do not know the truth or they love themselves more than they love Jesus and they love his word. They are not truly saved. You know, if, if you begin to present these things this way, you will find a lot of people who have got a religious spirit. They will simply quit and they will go. They will say, who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? You think that we are lost? Do you think that we are not saved? But you know, my sister and brothers, what is the proof? What is that litmus test that I'm truly saved, that I truly love the Lord? I am ready to face anything for my God. I'm ready to face persecution. I'm ready to face rejection. I'm ready to face everything that comes with it because I love the Lord before anything else. You know, when you love yourself, you don't want to be, you know, rejected. You don't want to be persecuted. You will simply follow the beaten track. You will simply agree with everything that the world says. But the moment you are going to follow the Lord, you want to please the Lord. You are not going to be one who's going to be politically correct. You're not going to be someone who says, oh yes, that's how it is done. So let's all follow it. You know, my brothers and sisters, I hope as yes, you're listening right now, you're waking up from your slumber. You're waking up from your sleep. There's a, there's a stirring up taking place as you're listening. Remember, if you are afraid of persecution, you are afraid of rejection, you are afraid of being spat at, you are afraid of being isolated because of Christ, you are really loving yourself more than you love Christ. But if you really think that you love Christ, even if you have to displease other people, even if you have to be reaching to a point where you are rejected, spat at, and even isolated because you love the Lord, welcome to the family of Christ. Welcome to the family of the chosen ones. Welcome to the charity of God. Welcome to the people who will one day make it to heaven. Because if you are truly saved, you are ready to face anything for Jesus. You are ready to face anything for Jesus. You know, my sister and brothers, in this particular verse, in verse number 22, Jesus was saying that the religious leaders would reject him and even kill him. Look at what he says. The son of man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and the chief priests 
and the scribes and be slain and be raised on the third day. Would be raised on the third day. Jesus is aware that the religious leaders will reject him and will kill him. Isn't this strange, my brothers and sisters, that those who say that they love God would kill the son of God? I'm asking you, if those religious leaders at that time, the Pharisees, the scribes, the chief priests, those people who were doing all their religion at that time, if they really love God, would they not be able to recognize this Jesus who was doing everything good? He was raising the dead. He was performing miracles. He was performing signs and wonders. You know, my sister and brothers, in the body of Christ today, people who got a religious spirit, people who are Pharisees, who got a Pharisaical attitude, they are blinded by Satan. And as a result, they cannot see what they can see with their physical eyes. They cannot see the glory. They can see it with their eyes, but they cannot believe it. Isn't it strange that these religious leaders at that time, after having seen all the miracles of Jesus, they wanted to kill the son of God. Is that really possible, my brothers and sisters? Is it really possible that people who call themselves Christian today, is it possible that you know people who call uh, themselves as believers today, is it possible for those who call themselves as sons and daughters of the, of the kingdom of God, can these children of God kill one another today? Can they kill one another today? You know, my sister and brothers, don't we kill today our fellow brethren by our words? You know, I was just with a class a short while ago, probably not even an hour ago. I was with my sisters in Perth and there the Lord was speaking to us, you know, as, as I was sharing the word, you know, Jesus of Nazareth was casting out devils by the word of his mouth. He was casting out evil spirits by the word of his mouth. And today, my brothers and sisters, we call ourselves believers but don't we kill our fellow brethren by our own words? Let me show you, you know, the spirit of God is trying to teach us something very beautiful. He's talking about persecution. He's talking about rejection. You know, many times because we don't want people to talk against us, we just want to be keep the status quo. We just want to be, you know, loved by everybody. We just want to feel accepted. We just want to be in that fellowship. We are not ready to speak what the Holy Spirit is speaking to us because of the fear of rejection. Let me show you why these things happen, why people open their mouth and what they do when they open their mouth, how they kill people by only their tongue. Let me take you to the book of James. James chapter 3, I believe. James chapter 3. Let's go from verse number 8 onwards. Verse number 8 or verse number... Yeah, let's go from 8 onwards. Let's read from verse number 8 onwards. James chapter 3, verse number 8. But the tongue can no let's, man... Let's read verse up to verse number 10. But the tongue... Can no man take? It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. David, bless we God, even the Father, and David, curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the mouth proceeds blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Look at it, my brothers and sisters. It says in verse number eight, but the tongue can no man tame. Nobody has been able to tame anybody's tongue. You know, my brother says the tongue does not have any solid. It's just some, some little bit of flesh piece that is inside our mouth. It can move. It can, it can open its mouth whenever it wants. That's what it says. The tongue no man has been able to tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. You know, my brothers and sisters, all the trouble that takes place in our life, it takes place because of our tongue. If only we could shut our mouths and not open our mouth and only speak when we have to speak and that could speak good things and speak the word of God and speak some encouragement. You know, my sisters and brothers, this tongue would have saved us or this, uh, you know, keeping quiet would have saved us from so much of trouble today. But the problem is most of the time we keep our mouth shut when we have to open this mouth and we open our mouth at the wrong places. You know, when we have to give glory to God, then we have to tell what is, when we tell what is black is black, white is white, we prefer to keep our mouth shut. When the Holy Spirit says, open your mouth and make that prayer, open your mouth and share your testimony, open your mouth and preach the gospel, we say we don't want to do it. We don't want to do it because when the Holy Spirit says, we refuse to open our mouth. But when we have to talk about the weather, we have to talk about, you know, what's happening on the streets, what somebody else is doing, we are quick to report. We are, we are, we are better off than those reporters in CNN 
and in uh, BBC. But you know, sisters and brothers, if we could control this tongue of ours, we could solve us, we could help ourselves from so much of poison. Look at what it says in verse number nine. Therewith, bless we God. We open our mouth and we sing songs of praise. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. That's what we do. We bless the Lord, even the Father. And David, we curse we men. We curse men. We open our mouth and we speak. We are coming to a Bible class sometimes. We go to church, we pray. And as soon as we come out of church, as soon as Bible class gets over, the first person that we meet in our own house, maybe our spouse, our children, or somebody on the phone, we have opened our mouth and we have spoken the filth of our, of our life. And therefore, this tongue has been used a few moments before to bless the Lord. And the same tongue has been used to curse the Lord. You know what he says? Therewith, curse we be men which are made after the similitude of God. We are, we are cursing men who have been made in the image and likeness of God. You know, my sister and brothers, we don't have any right to curse anybody. We have no right to criticize a fellow person. We have no right to, you know, pass judgment on anyone. There is only one righteous judge. None of us are capable of judging anybody. But the problem is we have sat on the throne of our life. We have sat on judgment throne. And, you know, the very things we are judging other people, we ourselves are doing. Sometimes, you know, we, 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 we get offended when, we, when, we, when we, somebody does something to us. But the same thing that offend us, we go and do it to somebody else. Do you think you will be spared for that? You know, sometimes my brothers and sisters, we open our mouth and, you know, we say so many nasty things. And then when we come to church, we come to Bible class, we open our mouths and we pray and we do a lot of things. This is hypocrisy. You know, we must be so careful with our words. We need to be very careful when we open our mouth if we are really children of God. See what he says in verse number 10. Out of the same mouth proceeds blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. It should never happen with the child of God. If you are a child of God, if you are heaven material, you're one day going to live with Christ for all eternity. My brothers and sisters, you cannot open your mouth and start speaking blessing and cursing with the same mouth. And then afterwards, you have cursed everybody. Then you go to somebody and say, pray for me. Then you open your mouth and make that prayer. Do you think that after using your mouth for the whole day, cursing everybody, complaining and murmuring, that you can come to the Lord and open your mouth and expect your prayers to be heard? There's no way, my sister and brothers, it will never happen. Because this heart will not be sensitive to what you are saying. Because all along, this heart has become insensitive to you because all that you're speaking is you're speaking your sight. You're speaking everything that you see, what you hear, what you taste, what you smell, and what you feel. You're dominated by your five senses. And therefore, brothers and sisters, when we open our mouth and start speaking the word, although the, we are speaking, we are praying, everybody around us, we begin to hear, we are praying in the spirit, we are praying according to the word of God, but that word of God is not working in your life because all the whole day, you have been cursing, you have been complaining, you have been murmuring, and then finally you want the Lord to answer your prayer when you speak his word. It cannot happen that way. Let me show you another verse, my brothers and sisters, about what it really takes, how we become murderers, even without taking a knife or a gun. Let me take you to this verse. 1 John, 1 John chapter 3, 1 John chapter 3, verses 15 onwards again, 15 to 17, I believe. Just go and take there, verse number 15. 1 John chapter 3, verse number 15 onwards. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But so, but whoso has this world's good and sees his brother have need and shuts up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwells the love of God in him? You know, my sister and brother, these verses from 1 John chapter 3 are so self-explanatory. You don't even need, you will need somebody to make you misunderstand because it's so clear with these verses. Look at what it says in verse number 15. Whosoever hates his brother is a murderer. Whosoever hates his brother or hates his sister is a murderer. 
I want to ask you right now in this class as you're listening, and those will be listening later, how many of us are murderers? If what this verse is the truth, if you believe God's word is the truth, I want to ask you, my brothers and sisters, how many of us are murderers? I'm not saying this. The word of God is saying whoever hates his brother is a murderer. Whoever hates his sister is a murderer. And you know, he says, that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. You know, my brothers and sisters, I want, to, I want you to understand this. Just because we go to church, just because we have been fasting and praying, we have been giving alms to the people on the street, but there are people in our life who have come against us and we hate them. We hate them that we don't want to see them. We don't want to talk to them. We have got nothing to do with them. And even when they pass through our life, even if they smile at us or even if they try to be, you know, be kind to us or even if for that matter, if they, if they are nasty towards us, we cannot respond to them in the same way as they respond. We are supposed to respond to them in love because we saw earlier that everybody has been made in the image and likeness of God. Even an unbeliever, you know, has to be given the love of God if you have experienced the love. So whosoever hates his brother is a murderer. So should there be ever hatred in our heart? There'll be so many reasons for us to have hatred in our heart because, you know, my brothers and sisters, when we live in this world, there are going to be people coming against us. There are people who are going to hate us. There are people who are going to come, you know, gossip about us. There are people who are going to, you know, there'll be many reasons why people will persecute us and come against us. And when that happens and we respond to them in the same way, we become murderers. They may not be murderers because they don't know the gospel. But if you and I are truly sons and daughters, we have just murdered somebody because we have not operated in love. And you know, my brother and sister, then he goes on to say, hereby perceive with the love of God, verse number 16, hereby perceive with the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for our brethren. You know, my brother and sister, how many of us are laying our lives? We may lay our lives for our son. We may lay down our life for our daughter. Some of us may lay down our life even today after many years of marriage for our spouse. I don't know. We may live our life for our parents. But how many of us are ready to lay down our lives for a fellow brother or a fellow sister who does not belong to my blood group, who doesn't belong to my blood family, who doesn't belong to my earthly family? How many of us are ready? When we begin to look at this heavenly father as one father of all of us, when we begin to see ourselves as brothers and sisters of Christ, of, 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 like, like Christ to this heavenly father, we will begin to feel that compassion We'll begin to feel that pain. We'll begin to feel that sorrow. We'll begin to feel the joy. We'll begin to you know, celebrate the success of our fellow brothers and sisters when they are doing good. We will never be envious. We won't be saying when somebody is doing well, oh, when will my chance come? When will I get that opportunity? Oh, if somebody is doing well, instead of celebrating and being joyful for my brother and sister, I am full of envy. I am full of poison on the inside. You know, my sister and brothers, that's not a child of God. That's not a child of God. Look at verse number 17. But whoso has this world's goods and sees his brother have need and shuts up his bowels of compassion from him. You know, this is, this is old English. You don't shut up your bowels. You know, when we talk about, you know, bowel movement, we're talking about, you know, being constipated. You know, you can't go to the bathroom. But I tell you, this is old English. The, the point is, what is he saying is, when you know somebody is in need, you know somebody is going through a problem, you know a fellow brother or a fellow sister, you have heard of somebody going through a trial and difficulty, but you simply ignore. You only become a reporter to others to say, and to gossip about that person to say, yes, he's not calm, or he's doing this, or he's having a marriage problem, or he's in hospital. You know, my sister and brothers, we become agents of the devil. We become agents of Satan by reporting to one another. When you hear some bad news about somebody, Go and be a blessing. Go and be the solution to that problem instead of only going there and gossiping about it. If you have been given something by the Lord, the Lord has blessed you with his word. He has given you the goods of this world. Go and sow in somebody's life. Go and be a blessing to somebody instead of only being reporters. You know, my sister and brother, that's exactly what it says. But you know what? It becomes very convenient for us to be a blessing to people who love us who come and, you know, be, make a fuss around us. It's very easy for us to love those people. But when people come against us, when people ignore us, people persecute us, for us to go the extra mile and be a blessing to them, to reach out to them in love, it takes the love of the Holy Spirit. It takes agape love to do that. 
And only if we do that, my sisters and brothers, then and only we can prove to God that we are his children, that we are truly saved. Let me take you to an Old Testament scripture. You know, it is in the book of Leviticus. Again, in the book of Leviticus, Leviticus 19. You can put the Leviticus 19, verse number 16 or 17. It talks about, you know, that we should not hate a brother by hiding the truth from him, by not telling him the truth. It's an Old Testament scripture, but it has got a lot of truth even today. Let's read that. Verse number 17, not 16. Verse number 17. Let's read that. Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thy heart. Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. What is this verse saying, my sister and brothers? It, it has got a spiritual truth, even though it's an Old Testament scripture. It has got a lot of truth even to this very day. You know, thou shalt not hate thy brother in thy heart. Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor. If somebody is doing something wrong, some of us will say, that's none of my business. Why should I soil myself? Why should I get into bad books with him? You know, if I see my neighbor, the husband of my, of my you know, there's a couple in my neighborhood and I see the wife has gone to work and the husband is bringing another woman. I will never want to go and confront them because it's none of my business. The husband is smiling at me. He says good morning to me. For Christmas, he gives me gifts. And you know, we are having a great relationship with the family. Why should I go and tell the wife that the husband is having an illicit affair? Because it's none of my business, but I'm showing myself that I don't even care. I don't even love. If you see something wrong, it's important for you as a believer to go and confront that person. Go and tell them the truth. If they reject it, that's their problem. But you never reject the truth for somebody. That's what it says, my brothers and sisters. Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. Which means you can let that other person reject the truth, but you never reject the truth for somebody. If you know the truth and you know somebody is doing wrong, please open your mouth. Go there, even if they are going to uh, you know, slap you, or even if they are going to spit at you, even if they are going to slam the door at you, at least you have the courage to go and tell them that black is black and white is white. You did not try to be a politician. You did not keep yourself back. How many of us today are simply taking that sin upon ourselves instead of opening our mouth and speaking the truth to somebody? You know, my brothers, if you really love somebody, I'm not talking about just loving your family or loving those who, who are good to you. I'm not even talking about, you know, just the human type of love. I'm talking about the God kind of love. If God loves something, God also hates something. So if you love God, you will also hate the things that God hates. How many of you are ready to hate the things that God hates or just be indifferent to that? That's why, my brothers and sisters, you should never have hate for your brother or your sister or your brethren. I'm not talking only about family members. This is not only talking about brothers and sisters of, of your, or your biological parents, but this is talking about brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. We should never stop, you know, from, you know, speaking to them, you know, uh, you know, confronting them if, if it is wrong, because you should not let them reject the truth. Sometimes, you know, they are blinded by the devil. Sometimes the sin has taken over. But if you begin to see something and you really love that brother, and you really love that sister and you really love God, you will surely confront even to the point of persecution, even to the point of rejection, even to the point of physical harm on you. Praise God, you did it because you love the Lord. Because you hate what the Lord hates. You hate certain things that you see. You will simply confront those things. And you know, my brothers and sisters, it's not about, you know, being just indifferent. It's just not about going to church. It's just not about going and doing the liturgy and doing your rituals. It's not about you doing all things. There are some people who always say, God for all. Each one for himself, God for all. Each one for himself, God for all. I heard these terms, terms many times before. But there is nothing for in the body of Christ, each one for himself, God for all. You can't live like an island. If you really belong to the body of Christ and you understand in the body of Christ, there are people who are living like jerks, who are living a sinful life and they belong to your fellowship. You better talk to them one to one. If they don't listen to you, take another witness. And if they don't take, after taking a witness, they don't listen to you. Just get the church to know what they are doing and get them out of your fellowship. But there are procedures to be followed. Don't immediately go onto the television and tell everybody because you have a brother or sister again. You know, most of the time, my sister and brothers, we don't follow the system of God. If we have a problem with somebody, we have a problem with a brother or sister, you know what we do? We'll tell the whole world about it. And instead of, you know, that situation getting better, 
it has become worse because everybody is gossiping. They will all put ma mirchi masala, they will put spice masala, and they will make the situation worse. If you have a problem, if there's a problem between X and Y, let X and Y sort it out amicably with the Holy Spirit between them two. If they have won each other, praise God, it ends there. But there are procedures to follow according to God's system. So, sister and brothers, the bottom line is, if you really love somebody, you will also hate the things that God hates. You will also hate the things that they hate. Your job is not to basically stay like a policeman to you know, watch everybody. But if there is something that happens in your path, in your, in your, in your circle of influence, if you really love that brother, if you really love the Lord, you will correct them and you'll correct them in love. You will correct them with the, with the correction of the Holy Spirit. Not because of rejection, not because, you know, they're going to isolate you, but because you really love that person. And most importantly, you love the Lord. Amen. Let's go to verse number 23. Luke chapter 9, verse number 23. You know, this is all talking about, you know, self-denial. Jesus is talking about so many things today. And, you know, my brothers and sisters, when we begin to understand these verses, it will help us to live a life like the master himself. Amen? Let's read that. And he said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Now, you know, my brothers and sisters, what is this verse talking about in verse number 23? He said to them all, that means he is now talking to his disciples. If any man will come after me. That means if any man wants to be a disciple, anyone wants to, you know, experience eternal life, anyone wants to live with me for all eternity, then you know, my sister and brother, Jesus is saying, if any man or any woman will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. You know, my sister and brothers, self-denial is an important part of the Christian life. Self-denial is a very essential, very crucial uh, requirement or very crucial virtue of a believer of the Lord Jesus Christ in order to live an authentic Christian life. You know, my brothers and sisters, it is the most important ingredient or characteristic of a truly, of a person who's truly saved. If you really are saved, then self-denial becomes a very important ingredient or very important, you know, what should I say, characteristic of a person who's truly saved. You know, sister and brother, Jesus sacrificed his life for us. He gave his life for us. You know, when he came to the earth, he even said, I will be, I will be crucified, I will die, I will be put to death, but third day I will rise again. So Jesus came onto this earth, you know, my brothers and sisters, in order to sacrifice his life for you and for me. And therefore, he demands we also die to ourselves that, you know, we might experience this new life that he has provided us. What sort of new life he has provided for us? You know, sister and brothers, think about it like this. When Jesus died on the cross, he died so that, you know, this old life that we are living, we will not live anymore. We will live a new life. We'll live a life of the Holy Spirit. We'll live a life of God. We'll live a Zoe life. We'll live a, a, a God kind of life. We'll become the charity of God. Do you think that you can become the charity of God? Can you be the beloved of the Lord? Can you be the chosen of the Lord? Can you really experience eternal life? It's so simple. It is simple, but provided, my brothers and sisters, we do it God's way. And you know, God has provided us, you know, he has provided us a way to do this. And how do we do this? First and foremost, how do we do it? Number one, we recognize that we can't save ourselves by our own effort. You know, you cannot say, we saw that so many times. You know, Jesus said, unless you believe in the Savior, unless you make me the Lord of your life, you can never save. That's why the religious people, they get crazy. The, the Pharisees, the religious leaders at that time, they just got crazy. How is this man saying that, you know, he's going to save them? They couldn't understand that it required the precious blood of Jesus to save everybody. They thought that their own effort could save them. Even in the body of Christ today, many, many congregations are preaching the same thing. They say, you must do this, you must fast, you must pray, you must go stations of the cross, you must go on your knees, you must go give alms to the poor, you must do works in order to be saved. They are speaking the gospel of the devil. You know, my sister and brothers, you cannot be saved with your own efforts. You cannot be saved with your own performance. You must recognize 
that we cannot be saved by our own efforts, period. That's all, you cannot do that. The second thing is we need to trust God, not ourselves or for our own salvation. We need to trust God. You know, if you trust God and you don't trust your own efforts, first and foremost, what you're going to do? Every day, you're going to put your faith and trust in his living word. You know, sisters and brothers, once we begin to trust God for, for, and not ourselves for salvation, then what are we going to do? Then we will daily need to deny our own wisdom, our own understanding, and begin to seek God's wisdom and direction for our lives. You know, you know, my, you know, my sister and brothers, let me tell you this. You know, many a times, you know, sometimes when we go to, when we get educated, we learn, you go to college, you get your degrees, you get 35 degrees, you get a lot of education. Sometimes people who are highly educated, they find themselves that this gospel becomes so difficult for them to understand because there's so much of knowledge of this world in them, so much of degrees that they have, that trusting God for, you know, for salvation, trusting God, you know, to give us the wisdom simply does not become their cup of tea. That's why God had to pick up ordinary fishermen who had never gone to college, who had never done theology, who had never done history, who had not done philosophy. He picked up ordinary simple men and he used them for his greater glory. You know, my sister and brothers, the first thing, as I said, we must recognize that we cannot be saved by our own efforts. And the second thing is we need to trust God not ourselves for salvation. And then, you know, every day we need to deny ourselves, deny, you know, our own wisdom, deny our own thinking, deny all that we are getting from this world and seek only God's wisdom and his direction for our lives. You know, sister, brother, let me again put this to you. Look at what he's saying in verse number 23. And he said to them all, if any man shall come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Follow me. You know, sister and brothers, self-denial, you know, is only good when it is denying ourselves for one purpose, one singular purpose of exalting Jesus and his will for us in every area of our life. You know, if you're going to exalt, if you're going to exalt yourself, you're going to glorify yourself because, you know, you're doing a lot of service, you're doing a lot of teaching, you're doing a lot, you're just trying to glorify yourself. If self-denial is going to make you that, then it is not self-denial. You know, my brothers, self-denial is only good when it is denying ourselves in order to exalt Jesus, to exalt his will into our life, to exalt him as the Lord of every area of our life. And you know, my brothers and sisters, some, you know, have made a religion out of self-denial and, 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 you know, they take pride in their denial, but not in Jesus' lordship. I don't know whether you're really understanding this. Sometimes, People have made self-denial their religion. They say, you know, I've given up everything. I've given up marriage. I've given up, you know, so much of property. I've given up so much of wealth. I've given up my family. And they take so much of pride in that denial, but they don't take pride in Jesus' lordship. Do you think that that is self-denial? You know, my brothers and sisters, so now when they have not, you know, denied themselves to make Jesus the lord of their life, what will happen now? It will lead to legalism. What I mean by legalism, you know, legalism is more that I have to do this, I have to do that, I have to wake up in the morning, I have to do this, I have to do that, and then it becomes a bondage. You know, which, which St. Paul, you know, condemned, he condemned this bondage. It is, he mentioned this call as will worship. If I say will worship, it means I have to do this. I have to. You don't do anything for God because you have to do it. You do it because you want to do it. You are in love with this God. You know, just like two lovers want to be with one another, they want to be because not they have to be. They want to be. In the same way, I want to be with Jesus. I want to fellowship with him. I want to hear his word. I'm so excited every time the word is preached. I'm so excited, you know, when I come to church. I'm so excited to hear his voice. I'm so excited to be, you know, receiving those new revelations from the Holy Spirit because I desire it. I'm hungry for it. And you know, my brother says, when I, when, I, when, I, when I go and do something because I have to, because God is looking at me, he's going to not bless me, he's going to condemn me. That is legalism. That is a bondage. Let me show you what St. Paul says in Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, verse number 23, I believe. Colossians chapter 2, verse number 23. St. Paul talks about, you know, will worship or something that, you know, he mentions as, you know, something that is forced upon us. It cannot be like that, my sister and brother. Let's read that. Which things have indeed a show of wisdom in will worship and humility and neglecting of the body, 
not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. So what is he saying here, my sister and brother? You know, when St. Paul writes this, this is when St. Paul is writing, that means the Holy Spirit is writing. You know, it would not be in the word of God unless that was the truth. And many a times we read the letters of St. Paul. He said, okay, St. Paul wrote it. It must be some letter to the Colossians, some to the Thessalonians. But brothers and sisters, this is the word of God. This is the word of the Holy Spirit. He's saying these things have indeed a show of wisdom in will worship and humility. It's all fake. It's all fake. And therefore, if it is fake, it can never bring any results. You know, my brothers and sisters, just making long prayers or trying to be, you know, religious or trying to, you know, all these things. This is all fake. You must understand it has to come from a heart that is totally surrendered to the Lord. It should come from a heart that is truly under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And you know, my brothers and sisters, we are told not only to deny ourselves, but to deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow Jesus. Can we go back to Luke chapter 9? Can we go back to Luke chapter 9? You know, in Luke chapter 9, verse number, we have been studying from verse number, which, what is that we have been studying from? Yeah, we have been studying from verse number 23. Look at, look at what it says in verse number 23. Yeah, it's on verse number 23. And he said to them, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. So brothers and sisters, what are we told? We are not just told to deny ourselves. Many people have taken this thing. I'm going to deny chocolates in Lent. I'm going to deny myself of meat. I'm not going, I'm going to deny myself of watching the TV. I'm going to deny myself of, you know, seeing the WhatsApp. I've got sometimes messages from people who say, hey, brother, I'm not going to go to WhatsApp now. So, you know, even if you send messages, I will not see them. What nonsense. You're going to miss the word of God. You're going to miss the videos. You're going to miss the reflection. So just because you're going to stop the WhatsApp, you're going to not listen to the word of God. So brothers and sisters, these are just things that we have just come out of our own and we think that we are just denying ourselves. But if you deny the Lordship of God, we are told that we are not only called to deny ourselves, but we are told to take up our cross daily and follow Jesus. You know, you know, you know, you know, my brothers and sisters, the real benefits of fasting. And I'm so tempted to come to this word of fasting, especially because we are in the season of Lent. And many of you, you know, would be fasting in the season of Lent. But I want to tell you something. You know, the real benefits of fasting come as a result of denying ourselves. You know, if you really understand what this fasting really means of denying yourself, sometimes, you know, when we hear somebody saying, you fast yourself from, you know, from watching pornography, fast yourselves from, you know, uh, spending too much of money, fast yourselves from, you know, uh, having too much of alcohol. These are only physical things. You know, you don't watch pornography, don't eat chocolates, don't eat uh, meat. These are all physical things. When we are talking about fasting, you start feeding yourself with the word. And as you begin to feed yourself with the word, my brothers and sisters, you will find that you'll be unnaturally, without any effort, will be fasting from so many things. Because as you begin to feed yourself with the word, the word will clean you. The word of God cleans us. And automatically, we will be fasting from so many things that we were not doing, which we were doing when we did not have the word. You know, my brothers and sisters, the real benefits of fasting come as a result of denying ourselves. However, however, if we fast only to glorify ourselves, we are fasting to tell others, you know, that I, hey, you know what, I'm fasting. This length, I'm going to fast. You know, from right from morning to evening, I'm going to fast. I'm going to take only one meal at the end of the day. If you're going to do that only for glorifying yourself, you know, my brothers and sisters, as the Pharisees, you know, the Pharisees did that. They did it only to glorify themselves. We will never have any reward from God. You know, what will fasting do for us? Such a fast is only going to make us hungry. Only it's going to make us hungry. You know, you know, you know sisters and brothers, whenever we do anything, like we saw in yesterday's gospel, some people, they do fasting to tell the whole world they are fasting. Some people are praying to impress others with their prayers. Some people are giving, you know, arms to the poor and they're saying, I help this, I give the church, I give to this, I'm tithing, I'm sowing, and just to tell everybody that they are doing this. You're not supposed to do that to tell others. God knows your heart. He knows why you're doing that because you have been filled with the love of God. So, brothers and sisters, if you're fasting just to impress others, don't do it. Do fasting so that it will train your mind not to focus on your senses, but to focus on the word of God. Then what does he say? He says, let him deny himself 
and take up his cross daily and follow me. You know, what does he say? Take up your cross. Take up your cross. You know, the cross is what Jesus himself died for us on that cross. You know, if you look at the cross, you can see that cross, please. You know, if you look at the cross, my brothers and sisters, it was on that cross of Calvary that Jesus died. You know, this is a cross that I have with me. You know, the cross has got two elements. It has got a vertical element and it has got a horizontal element. This is on what Jesus died. You can see this, they're, they're just, this cross has shown Jesus is hanging on that cross. And you know, my brothers and sisters, this cross actually are the circumstances of our lives that Jesus himself on that cross gave up. These are the opportunities that come in our life to die to ourselves. You know, don't look at the cross and say, oh, Jesus died for me. Oh, so thank you, Jesus, and shed a tear, and that's the end of it. You know, my brothers and sisters, there are so many circumstances in our life like that, like the cross of Jesus, that give us an opportunity, you know, to, to die to ourselves every single day of our life. You know, these are not things like, you know, sickness and poverty and, you know, mess in our marriages and so many things of which Jesus has already atoned for on the cross of Calvary. He's already provided us redemption on the cross of all our sickness. I was just teaching this afternoon to our sisters in Perth from Matthew chapter 8, verse 17. I was telling them that, you know, what was prophesied by Isaiah, it has already been done by Jesus. So don't call yourself when you're sick that, you know, you're carrying your cross. If you're, if you're having a bad marriage, don't say you're carrying your cross. If you're basically going through poverty, you're not carrying your cross. Jesus has already atoned us for all this. But rather, things like persecution from which we are not redeemed and the constant battle that takes place between our mind and our born-again spirit. This is the cross that we are supposed to bear. You know, my brothers and sisters, when we are living on this planet Earth, there is always going to be a battle between the mind, that is the flesh, and our born-again spirit. Our born-again spirit wants us to walk against in the spirit. That's why when you walk according to the spirit, you will not walk according to the flesh. Jesus never said, you know, I won't say Jesus, St. Paul, he writes to the Galatians, says, you know, it's not that the way that, you know, you stop walking in the flesh, then you walk in the spirit. He says, start walking in the spirit, and then you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. So you need to walk according to God's word. You need to do what God's word says. And you know, my brothers and sisters, our cross that we must bear is to take God's word, which is God's will, and exalt it above our own will in every situation that we face every single day of our life. Let me say this again. You know, many people think that when I'm carrying my cross, they look at the physical world. They think, you know, I'm going through so much of hardships. I'm going through so much of, you know, bad marriage. I'm going through so much of health problems. You know, I don't have a proper money coming in. I don't know how to pay my rent. And that's my cross. That's not your cross. That is your ignorance to God's word. That is already atoned for Jesus. But the real cross that you and I are called to bury, carry, my brothers and sisters, is the cross that we are called to bury is to take God's word, to take the will of God. God's word is God's will. And, you know, raise it up, exalt it above our own will in every situation, in every circumstance of our life, every single day of our life. And that is why, my brothers and sisters, it is very important that we take up our cross every single day. Every day we need to take our cross. You know, it's not just taking our cross once in a while when we come to Bible class and probably at some part of the day, like a breakfast or a lunch or dinner. You know, consistency, my brothers and sisters, is one of the most important keys in subduing the flesh. It's consistency. And consistency will come when we have that commitment. If we don't have commitment, we will never be consistent. So, my brothers and sisters, we need, we cannot, you know, we cannot, you know, you know, I would say seek God, you know, in, 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 in you know, in, 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 like, what should I say? In, like, in, like, like, you know, uh, one time the pendulum goes high, one day the pendulum goes low, like, you know, in, in, in spurts or something like that, you know, you can't, Take him, uh, seek the Lord in one time in the morning, then seek him sometime in the afternoon, seek him sometime in the evening, or seek him once a week on a Sunday. You know, my brother, that's not how it works. You will never reach maturity like that. The victory goes to those only who have the abiding of God's word in them. You know, many people, I, I will tell you here in this very class, right now, which we started this Bible class two years ago, many people came to this Bible class. They came for many months. After they came for many months, God got them sorted out got them a job, got them, you know, their problem solved, they got their health problem solved, they got their miracle. And then even on their holidays, even on the days, you know, when they can possibly listen to the video, 
they don't listen to the video they don't even come to the class they don't even give their testimony because now they got their miracle now whatever they were coming for the job is done you know there's a there's in, in, it's in our local language here you know in in where i belong to the local dialect it's called in konkani i will translate that word to you it says uh, in in konkani it says kam zale hoy smelo in the sense that the job is done and the doctor is like literally if you understand what's my job is done bye bye jesus until the next problem you know my friend sister it doesn't work that way victory goes to those only who abide in him you know and if you abide in his word the word is always before you you're letting your sensitive to the holy spirit the holy spirit is the captain of your life he's directing your life it will not matter what people say to you you will not be you know you'll be upset or you'll be hurt by petty things of you know what somebody said to you because you you have experienced the love of god and the problem is most people are so superficial you know a little bit of offense a little bit of hurt there they are completely broken because they are all so superficial they come for their own glory they come for their own you know for their own agenda but when you come for the lord you are not going to be offended by people you are going to come because you want to build your relationship and you want to grow in your relationship with the lord you want to have his abiding word inside of you and that's why my own sisters if you really want to mature in the lord you really want to grow in your relationship with him you want, you believe that you are heaven material then you want to reach maturity you want to grow in victory through the abiding word that is on the inside every single day of our life amen let's go to verse number 24 For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. You know this verse, my brothers and sisters, is not saying that we have to suffer some sort of a, like a martyrdom in order to receive salvation. Many people think, you know, look at this verse: For whosoever shall save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake. the same shall save it so the moment you read this verse literally it, some people will say oh maybe jesus is saying i should be martyred you know i should be like stephen i should be like the 12 apostles you know my brothers and sisters rather this verse is is referring back to us denying ourselves and following jesus you know if if all of us are going to be martyred then who's going to be left to you know share the gospel but you know my sister and brothers once you're martyred once you're dead finish your innings are over there's no more chance for you to to do anything in the kingdom or do any work on this planet earth so this verse is not talking about martyrdom yes martyrdom can be possible it's rather talking about denying ourselves and following jesus you know my brothers and sisters many people have desired salvation from god but have been unwilling to let go of the things that stand between them and stand between god you know many people they want salvation at their own at their own cost you know my brothers and sisters if there is something there is something in your life that is stopping you from growing in your relationship there probably you know it could be a family member probably it could be somebody who's you know too 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 clingy to you maybe it's a friend who's all the time demanding your time or there is somebody who's all the time you know asking you silly questions or there is somebody who's you know there's a particular activity that you are so much in you know you know playing tennis or is playing a sport or going to the television or trying to you know do some activity which is going to be lifeless and because you love to do it because you know it gives you a lot of pleasure if you're going to do that and it is going to take you away from your relationship with the lord stop it stop it because this is going to stop you and stop your relationship with the lord so anything that stands between you and your god don't allow it to remain for too long because the more you allow it the more you tolerate it it's going to simply you know take you away i'm going to say this my brothers and sisters you know only fools listen to this very carefully you know only fools will give up what they cannot keep to gain what they cannot lose let me say this again to you only a fool will give up what they cannot keep in order to gain what they cannot lose amen you know if you're going to you know give up something in order for your relationship with the lord to really grow then you know what you're not a fool anymore because you're going to gain your salvation you're going to gain the the approval of the ceo of heaven the creator so if only a fool will will give up anything that they cannot you know keep to gain what they have not received forever and that is what it is we are we are all we are all supposed to become fools for christ 
you know many people don't want to become fools for Christ. They, they still believe in their in their in their so called position, their status. They've got an image of themselves, and they are afraid to look like fools for Christ. They don't want to you know let they don't want to make a fool of themselves for Christ. They can make a fool of themselves by opening their mouth and talking rubbish. But for Christ, they don't want to make their, themselves a fool. But only if you understand that only fools will give up what they can keep to gain what they cannot lose. Because, you know, a fool for Christ understands that he's going to give up something in order to build his relationship, to build his intimacy with the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. You just cannot miss that. You just cannot get away from that. And that is exactly what you and I are called to do every single day. And this is the time for us to do a self-evaluation. Don't take length as just as, you know, fasting and praying. But let this be a time of self-evaluation. Let us take an audit of our life. Let us see where we stand in our relationship with the Lord. Let us spend time more with his word. Let us ask the Holy Spirit to, you know, give us that, you know, sensitivity to the word of God so that we can start, you know, changing our lives, start changing the way we are thinking so that, you know, we can start bearing fruit in the kingdom of God. Amen. Let's go to our final verse for today. Luke chapter 9, verse number 25. For what is a man advantaged if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away? You know, my sister and brothers, this verse is really something that should really, you know, shake the whole foundation on which we, we are standing right now. You know, there is no second chance in eternity or there is no second chance after our death on this world. And you know, if we are born again, then it is praise God, it's wonderful. If we are not born again, if we have never accepted Christ, there is no second chance in eternity and there is no second chance after our death. What is he saying in verse number 25? For what is a man advantage? For what good it is for a man if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away? You know, my friends, this is a very sad case. It's a very sad case. You know, I've seen so many people when they were living, nobody ever went and shared the word with them. But the moment they died, they had all the praises for that person. Oh, he was a good man. She was a good woman. Praise God, she's gone to be with the Lord. When they were living, nobody ever said that. When they were living, they realized that there was so much that they could have done by reaching out to that soul or giving them the good news. You know, my brothers and sisters, one can gain a lot of name, can gain a lot of fame and all the wealth of this world. But you know, if we have never known Christ, we have never known Jesus, the truth has never set us free. We are simply doomed. That's what this verse is saying. You know, when, when somebody is preaching the gospel and you come to verse number 25, you don't want to tell anybody, you know, that this is exactly what it was because gospel is supposed to be good news. The gospel is supposed to be good news. But when you come to verse number 25, it says, what is a man advantage if he gain the whole world and lose himself and be cast away? So even though it is in the gospel of today, I still have to tell you that this is not so good news for those who don't make Jesus the Lord of their life. You know, once a person dies, the people who have to bury them, they'll say, oh, he was a nice person. Even the mortuary card will say, coming home, coming home. Which home? I don't know. Which home I don't know. And we will always say he's gone to be with the Lord. Who knows whether he's really gone to be with the Lord. You know, sisters and brothers, what is the remedy for this? What is the remedy? If you really know somebody like this, as I said to you already earlier, you know, we need to accept Jesus as our Lord by surrendering to him and, you know, letting him rule our life without any compulsion or without any force. You know, God is not waiting with a stick for us. He's not waiting with a danda for us. And he's saying, Better change, or I'm going to give you a, you know, if you read today's first reading from the book of Deuteronomy, you know, the Lord says, choose life. He says, I'm giving before you a choice between life and death, between good and evil. Choose life, he says, choose life. He even gives us the answer. And you know, my brothers and sisters, he's not a God who uses force at us. He doesn't use compulsion at us. You know, it must be a willing and it must be according to our own free will. It should be all through because of love that, you know, he rules over us and leads us, you know, and leads to our life through, through the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, if you, if you really believe that this God loves us, he has the best plans for us. He desires the good things for his children. All we need to do is simply surrender our lives to Christ 
allow him to be the ruler of our life let his word direct us you know many a times our emotions somebody said something somebody insulted me some little silly thing and we don't come to bible class we don't go to hear god's word we don't want to come to that preacher we don't we are simply offended by so many things but you know my sister and brother when you understand that you know instead of being offended at what you heard instead of being offended at the at the preacher don't let offense to god's word stop you from becoming a mature christian if you really begin to love christ you love his word you're going to keep your eyes on jesus the author and finisher of our faith and if you keep your eyes on him he'll take us on an awesome journey and you know all this journey even though sometimes the ride will be bumpy it may not be smooth but you will still enjoy the bumpy ride in spite of all the persecution in spite of all the rejection in spite of people spitting at you in spite of people keeping you alone you will still enjoy the ride because the lord of lords and the king of kings through his abiding word is with us amen let us pray in the name Sister of Wendy, the father let us pray yes yes ma'am in the name of the father son of the holy spirit amen <laughs> Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, for helping us to speak boldly the truth and not to have a pharisaical attitude. Thank you, Lord, that you are strengthening us to tame our tongue to edify others and proclaim the truth and not judge others. Thank you, Lord, that our heart has become sensitive to your word only, and this word is helping us. <clears throat> to lay our lives for our brethren just the way you laid your life for us thank you lord that you have filled our hearts with your agape love so that we can now share this same agape love with our brethren help us lord to deny ourselves to exalt you in every area of our life and to experience the zoe life that you came to give us give us in jesus name amen Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sister Wendy, for that very spiritual, powerful concluding prayer. Thank you, Jesus. Thank, Thank you, Jesus. Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.